من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين الهداة المهديين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Dear brothers and sisters, inshallah, today we will continue our discussion about getting to know Islam and becoming familiar with the essence of our Islamic teaching by looking at those concepts which the Quran and which the teachings of the Prophet and the progeny of the Prophet have given us in order to get to know Islam. And as we will see, this is not an impossible goal. For us to say that I have a familiarity, I have a closeness, I have a recognition of my religion, which is not just a matter of facts that I have on a piece of paper which I might memorize, or practices which I do, but I'm just superficially performing and that are not really developing a relationship. And today, w the one concept that I would like us to briefly contemplate and think about is the relationship that binds believers to one another. The relationship that allows us to consider ourselves connected to one another. What is our relationship to one another. Are you individuals and I am an individual? And that individuality and my personal agency is the first and the most important thing about me? You have your freedom, your agency, your individuality. And then as individuals, we might interact and agree about certain things and disagree about other things. And then we go our separate ways. Are we partners that are trying to accomplish a certain goal together? Maybe to acquire something, to protect ourselves against something. Is it a partnership? Or is there some other basis for our relationship? We don't often think about our ties with our fellow believers sufficiently. And the result is that in many cases, the relationship of Muslims with one another is a passive relationship. It is a relationship that is rooted in a particular need, a particular project, maybe a particular threat. And then when that need or that project or that threat is no longer relevant, then our ties also become weaker. Right now, if there is going to be somebody who is going to maybe threaten Muslims or maybe have a rally where they are going to dishonor the Quran, God forbid, as has happened in the recent past, then it will be easy to bring Muslims together. 
and say that we have a common purpose. Right now, it's not important what your views on Azadari are. It's not important what your views on celebrating the birthday of the Prophet are. It's not important what your views on the relationship of Islam and Sufism are. We have more important things to work on. But then when that threat passes, all of a sudden those same issues will become very relevant. They might divide us and we might not be able to come together again. Now does the Quran give us a basis for us to understand our relationship that is not passive, but that is a meaningful and an active basis for me to have a relationship with you? And we find that in Surah Al-Hujurat. In verse number 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Now the word ikhwa is a plural in Arabic, and the singular is akh. And it is said in Arabic, according to some lexicographers, that the word akh in Arabic has two plurals. There is ikhwatun, and there is ikhwan. Ikhwan muslimin, that is from the other plural. But these lexicographers say, these people who have spoken about the nature of the Arabic language and words, is they say that the plural ikhwan is used for both a literal brother and a figurative brother. So sometimes we say that my friends were like brothers. And we have a fraternity or a group of people who are very close to one another socially and maybe in terms of their interactions, in terms of their relationship. That fraternity, that brotherhood is not literal, but it is a figurative relationship. And that is what the word ikhwan can denote. But the other plural, ikhwa, is not used figuratively, it's used literally. So ikhwa refers to people who are descended from the same parents, siblings, brothers or brothers and sisters in a more general sense. That is what ikhwa refers to. And when the Quran speaks about the relationship among believers, the Quran does not say, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَانَ the believers are like brothers or like siblings. But it uses that plural which in Arabic language and in Arabic usage is generally associated with a literal relationship. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً We have that in English sometimes and people generally misuse it or they misunderstand it and it's frustrating for many people. So right now, for example, if it's 8.15 and many of you have been fasting for the entire day and you're hungry, some of you will say, I'm literally dying right now. Is that frustrating for some people? I'm literally dying, what do you mean? If you were literally dying, then we would have to call an ambulance and we would have to take you away and have you treated to prevent you from actually dying and having to have funeral arrangements made. What do people mean when they say that I am literally dying? They mean literally, not in the sense of figuratively, but they mean that it's so close that I want you to actually picture a person who is dying and that's how I feel. Now, some people say that that's a bad usage of the word literally because that is exactly what the word figuratively means. But then if I were to tell you I am figuratively dying, it wouldn't have much meaning for you, would it? I say literally not because it's actual literal death, but because I want to draw a vivid image of your mind, think of someone who is dying and think of how that would affect a person, that's how I feel. So when the Quran is drawing an image, it's doing the same thing. It's telling us, I could have used the word ikhwan, and all of us have a concept of fraternity and close friends, and we're so close we feel like family, but that's not what the Quran wants us to think about. It says, innamal mu'minuna. Ikhwatun. Believers are like blood brothers and sisters, are like siblings, 
They are literally brothers and sisters, but not literally in the sense of actually being literally, literally in the sense of that vivid image. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So that's how the Quran wants us to think of our relationship. Now we have a problem when we talk about brothers and sisters, when we talk about siblings. And the problem is that that image, whether it be literal or figurative, is not really operative in our culture. It's kind of like if uh, we were to draw an image about navigation by the stars. When we say that Ahlul Bayt are like the stars in heaven in providing guidance, or when there is a forged hadith made by uh, those who wish to bring others in competition with Ahlul Bayt, and they said, Ashabi kan nujum. Right? That doesn't mean much because you and I, we look at the sky, and if we're in an urban environment, we just see nothing. And if we go camping, we might see some stars, but most of us would not be able to find the North Star or a constellation, and certainly not be able to navigate ourselves back to civilization by looking at the stars. So that example does not really mean much to us because we don't have that type of a relationship with the sky. People who actually used the sky for navigation, who used the sky for guidance, in terms of finding their way and maybe finding out what season it was and what time of night it is. For them, it wasn't unusual that the sky was divided up into constellations because those constellations are what allowed them to be able to find their way and to navigate. For us, you and I, we might look at the sky, we say, why is there a constellation? Why is this group of stars called Taurus? It doesn't look like a bull to me because it's, something which is not relevant to us. You do find in the ahadith, sometimes that example is given, but it doesn't really have meaning unless we delve into what that constellation, what the stars meant to people in that time. Another example we have in our du'as, in the Qur'an, in our ahadith, is examples from slavery. And we say that Ibadur Rahman Alladina Yamshuna Adal Ardehona. How do we translate that? Ibadur Rahman. Ibad is the plural of Abd. You can translate it as worshippers, and you can translate it as slaves. But generally, if I were to say slaves of Allah, then because of our culture, because of our linguistic usage today then it might give a different image, not of servitude and of humility, but maybe of oppression and being unwilling in what you are doing. We don't really have any imagery of slavery that would be relevant to the imagery that the Quran and our du'as are trying to create for us. And so when we speak of Ibadur Rahman, maybe it's more useful for us to say, servants of the most merciful because it is servitude and it is humility that this verse is uh, eliciting in our heart and in our mind that's not a mistranslation we're not covering up something that's in the quran by saying servants but ibadur rahman although it literally would have referred to slavery in that time the type of relationship that it was bringing up is a relationship that was not primarily about injustice or oppression because people at that time thought of slavery as the natural order of how a society worked. But it was a matter of servitude and humility that would be a uh, result of seeing those words. That's why people would say that it is an honor for me to be a servant or a slave of the Prophet and his progeny. To be an Abd of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Was an honorable thing. Innama ana abdun min abid Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who says that? That is a quote from 
أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه الصلاة والسلام yeah. So the one whom the Quran says and whom the Prophet says is like the nafs and the equal or the, at least the, share, uh, the, the sharer of the Prophet in his message and in his spirituality, not in his prophethood, says that it is an honor for me to be a slave among the slaves of Muhammad. But that image does not really have much meaning for us and so maybe we should think of it as servant. So my point is that when the Quran says that the relationship that defines you and me and our connection to one another is brotherhood, we have to first question, do we understand what brotherhood is and what it meant in the language and in the logic of the Quran for us to say that we're like brothers? Because today, it's very easy for a family to be separated and brothers to lose touch with one another, and siblings almost to be in competition with one another more than they are in a cooperative relationship. It's uh, something that I don't need to dwell on because if you haven't seen it in your own family, then give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at your neighbors. And if not your Muslim neighbors, then look outside of the Muslim community and you will see that brotherhood is something that is not actually very meaningful. And I've heard that sentiment expressed by Muslims, you can't choose your family, you can choose your friends. And so friends are valuable. And family, well, you have to suffer with them. Yes, you can't choose your family. Who chooses your family for you? Nature? Some random uh, machine in the heavens? Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is a choice in both cases. My friends, I choose according to my limited knowledge. My family, my parents, my children, my siblings, my relatives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses in his infinite knowledge and wisdom. So should I value my choice above Allah's choice or Allah's choice above my choice? Now, this is something that was natural and was organic at one time in our societies and in our civilizations. People understood that. And so they valued their friendships. And they might have seen eye to eye with their friends in a way that they did not see eye to eye with their own siblings. But they also understood that the natural order of things, not because of nature, but because of Allah, is that family and relatives and blood relations in particular have a special importance. And so it was something which was meaningful. Today, in our time, perhaps the closest thing that we can say to that relationship of fraternity is the relationship of a parent to a child. That still has some meaning today. A parent is willing to sacrifice. A parent is willing to suffer for the well-being of the child. But even that example is not very good because it used to be the case that parents would be willing to live in poverty in order to pay for their children's education. Today, if I look at people my age, in their 30s and in their 40s who have young children, they say, if I pay off my student loans, then I'll be happy. My children can figure it out on their own. I'm not going to give up my hobbies, my time off, my freedom, my personal development in order to make life easier for my children. In many cases, they were beneficiaries of sacrifices made by parents and by grandparents. I know many people who are my age who benefit from that free child care and health care given by their parents. But I can see just by the way that life is progressing that their children might not have that same benefit in their lives. So I can say that somehow parenthood is a remnant of that relationship 
that was very meaningful in history, but even that is much more diluted than it was in times past, much more diluted than it should be. And I don't say that as a criticism or to mock myself, first of all, or my generation, or those who might be coming after me. But these are things that we should be aware of. We shouldn't be passive observers of how society is changing. Because one of the things that Islam wants us to do is to be able to value relationships and value connections in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had intended. And if certain things lose their importance in our society, then we may need to reassert and reaffirm the importance of those relationships before it is entirely lost. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So what is a brotherly relationship then? What is the relationship of siblings? Just as I said that we might need to explain fraternity in terms of parenthood, we might need to explain navigation in terms of a GPS rather than stars. We might need to explain the relationship of ubudiyah as terms of a servant rather than a slave. We have to connect and create an understanding of fraternity. First and foremost, for us to reconnect with our blood siblings and our relatives. Because that is something that is diluted in our time. It's lost much meaning. And second of all, for us to create a relationship with our fellow believers on the basis of that wisdom. So the first question that I asked, those of you who are fasting and might have lost my train of thought, then I will repeat it in order to make sure that we are all on the same page and we're moving towards our conclusion. What is the basis of our relationship as Muslims that we are to think of as the thing that ties us together? The Quran says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Believers are like siblings, like blood relatives, like full siblings. We are literally brothers and sisters. But then because brothers and sisters often don't have fraternal relationships among themselves when they are actually from the same mother and father and were raised together and speak the same language and have much of the same culture and shared memories, when that has often lost its meaning, how is it going to be possible for us to use that as a basis to move beyond disunity in a broader Muslim community? And so let us pause a little bit and look at how that relationship was defined in a hadith of Ahlul Bayt The first hadith I would like to look at is a hadith of Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salatu wassalam. A very prominent companion of our fifth Imam, Jabir ibn Yazid al Ju'fi. Many of you may have heard of Jabir al Ju'fi. He was a very well regarded companion of Imam Muhammad Baqir al Hisalam, but he's also well known among Sunni scholars and Sunni muhaddithin. And although he is somewhat a controversial figure, especially because of his close connection with Ahlul Bayt and in particular with Imam Baqir, but in spite of that, many Sunni scholars have also regarded him as a truthful and a reliable narrator of hadith. In the Shia world, he is regarded as a particularly close companion of our fifth Imam in particular, and he also was a companion of our sixth Imam. So Jabir ibn Yazid al Jufi, he comes to Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salam. He says that sometimes inni ahtamu lighayri musibatin tusibuni. Sometimes I feel sad without there being any musiba or any cause that I can discern. I just feel depressed. And sometimes even my family can come and note that something's off. My friends, they come, يَعْرِفُ ذَلِكَ صَدِيقِي My friend comes and says that something is not right. You seem somewhat down. So what is the cause 
of this type of a feeling that I might have. And Imam Baqir says, oh Jabir, what do you care? What does it matter to you? Sometimes it happens. The uh, companion, Jabir, he says, I would like to know what is the cause of that. And this is now why it's important for us to know who Jabir is. The hadith is reported by Sheikh Quleini in Al-Kafi, and it has a decent chain of transmission. It's been recorded in one of our authentic compilations of hadith. Jabir was somebody whom the Imam used to give his somewhat less public messages to. He was one of Ashabu Sir of Imam Baqir, meaning that he was able to withstand a message that's not just superficial, but that requires a certain level of faith and a certain level of depth to understand. And so the Imam gives an answer that is accordingly rooted in our conception of Islamic spirituality. If this answer or this hadith does not make sense to you, then it's not our place to reject it. But it is our place to say that we are not yet there to be able to understand it. The Imam first discourages Jabir and says, why is it important to you? It's just a given. Sometimes you feel tired. Sometimes you feel energetic. Jabir says, I would like to know, and the Imam answers. He says that when believers were created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the tina, the creation of the human being from that spiritual matter or that material that Allah used to create us, that tina, that initial mud that Allah used to create believers, it was from a single heavenly source. Believers were created from the same substance. From a substance that came from the heavens, from a spiritual source. And because they were created from a similar source, they are affected by similar factors. And they can feel the effect that is found in one person in the other person. It's kind of like if you have an unknown substance and then you might test its weight, its uh, receptivity to certain chemical reactions, whether it's magnetic, whether it's a conductor, and then you will be able to understand that substance. Two substances that come from a similar source will have certain similarities, certain properties that they share. They might either both be magnetic or not, both be conductors of heat or not, both be conductors of electricity or not. The Imam says that believers were created from the same tina. Therefore, sometimes when you are feeling down, it is because something bad has happened to a fellow believer. And then the Imam says that فَلِذَٰلِكَ الْمُؤْمِنُ أَخُ الْمُؤْمِنُ فَلِذَٰلِكَ الْمُؤْمِنُ أَخُ الْمُؤْمِنِ لِأَبِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ A believer is a full brother of a fellow believer. And the word here used is أَخُ الْمُؤْمِنُ A full brother, but the relationship applies to believing men and it applies to believing women. The plural ikhwa, it's used for siblings. It's part of the usage of Arabic. So it's not exclusive to men, but it applies to believing brother men and believing women. The result the Imam gives from this explanation of the creation of believers is that believers are like full brothers to one another. And that also is a solution. If you ever have those feelings of being down, then before you look for some of the modern ways of trying to resolve that sadness, and it can be drugs, which have their place, but which should not be your first line of defense. It can be therapy, which has its place, but it is not necessarily your first line of defense. And for many people, it's consumerism. 
When the going gets tough, then the tough they go to the mall. And they replace their wardrobe or they buy themselves something. Many of us are like that. We can laugh at it, but we actually not only respond with the food and with a consumer mentality when we're feeling down, but when we have something new, it makes us feel better, at least for a limited time. So that shows that we are receptive to that stimulus. But the Imam is giving us a different answer. That when you are feeling down, perhaps the cause is that something has happened in a fellow believer that is causing that person to be depressed. And reaffirming and reestablishing that connection and then solving the sadness in your fellow believer might bring happiness to yourself. It's a very deep spiritual point. And if you don't want to take it as a spiritual point, then there are social studies that also indicate that living a life of purpose and meaning is something that will bring happiness to you. Now, I would hope that you and I will not look at it in terms of those social studies and say that, well, therefore, this is a good idea. We should be uh, volunteering more often. Take it in the spirit that Imam Baqir والسلام, mentioned it. which is a spiritual point, and a point that reflects the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what brings good to our soul. But if we can't understand it at that level, then at the very least understand it at the level of it brings happiness and it can bring purpose and meaning and reduce some of our sadness. So in many cases, to reflect on these types of a hadith, and because we're out of time, I will conclude with this hadith, this is what can bring meaning to our life the relationship between a sibling and the relationship between believers is one where we share our happiness and our sadness. We try to have an empathy with one another and where your sadness is my sadness, your happiness and triumph is my happiness and my triumph. I live through you and you live through me. And so when my brother or my sister is down on their luck, then I cannot feel like I am at the top of the world no matter what might be happening in my life. And when they are happy, then I cannot feel down and out no matter if I'm going through a difficult patch because my life and their life is not the life of two individuals, but it is a shared life. And that was the spirit that allowed parents to sacrifice so much for their children. It's not because they didn't appreciate the value of a skiing trip in the Rocky Mountains. They were too foolish to say that that $5,000 can pay for a decent vacation rather than paying for a college education for their children. It's not because their horizons were limited but it's because their horizons were not rooted just in their own personal pleasure, but they saw their children as part of their own soul and as a continuation of their existence. They derived pleasure from giving pleasure and giving a good life to their children. And because perhaps we sometimes have lost sight of that, and we don't see others as extensions of ourselves and as part of ourselves, some of that altruism doesn't make sense anymore. And if we understand the relationship of brothers and siblings, then we can appreciate what it was like for Ahlul Bayt والسلام, through their sufferings to have the company of their loved ones. And I have been requested to recite a brief musiba and it is almost Maghrib time so I will be very brief but let us remember the relationship of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu salam with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas all of those things that we can imagine and that we can describe of what a brother meant for a brother those were just a small part of the relationship of our third Imam and his brother Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. It was as if 
For the average eye, you could say that it is one light that illuminated both hearts. It was one mission that carried both of them from Medina to Karbala. It was one spirit of sacrifice that allowed Imam Hussein to have parched lips while he was providing water and sustenance to others. But that meant that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas's lips were just as parched as the lips of Imam Hussein. And it was that reason that you can understand the words of Lady Zainab where she said, that as long as I saw my brother Abbas and I saw the standard of Abbas, then I felt that I was safe and I was protected. There was no need to wonder at how many thousand soldiers were lined up against the enemy, against the Imam. How many the enemy were. Because for Imam Hussein and for Lady Zainab Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, their brother, was a source of strength and support. So imagine just that scene. When Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas comes to Imam Hussein and he says, Oh my master, oh my mullah, oh my sayyid, there is no more of our army that remains. I come to you humbly with permission, with asking that permission to go to the battlefield. And the Imam begins to delay. And he says, oh my brother Abbas, go first and ask Lady Zainab if she gives you permission and then come to me. And then when Abbas, Abbas السلام, comes back to the Imam, he says, do I have permission to go and fight? Still the Imam, he says with a wistful tongue that, oh Abbas, if I send you to fight, then what will remain of my army? A general, a commander says to his soldiers, protect your standard bearer. He doesn't send his standard bearer out alone in front of the enemy. Abbas, rather than unsheathing your sword and facing the enemy, would you go and see if you can quench the thirst of these children who from morning until now have not had anything to drink? And now, Abbas السلام, has a mission. He goes, he fills his water skin with water. But that brotherhood and that loyalty demands that he remains thirsty. And he comes back towards the Imam. I don't have time to remind us of the scene that developed as the Imam watched and as Abu al-Fadr al-Abbas galloped from the banks of the Euphrates River back towards the Imam and the successive blows that lodged themselves on the body of the Abba, body of Abbas and as he fell from his horse and as the water began to flow from the water skin that he had carried but just one final scene as he fell from his horse covered with injuries covered with wounds Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas said, As-salamu alayka ya mawlaya. Oh my master, my final greetings. And it is said that when Imam Hussein came to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he had one request. He said, oh my brother, you always referred to me as your master. You always referred to me as your commander. You always referred to me as your Mola Abbas. With whatever breath you have in your body, can you say once that, oh Hussein, oh my brother, I am glad that you are by my side. And Imam heard those final words of Abu al-Badl al-Abbas that were his only consolation at that last. Abbas alayhi salam said, my brother Hussein, I bid you farewell. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Brothers and sisters, we have been requested to recite Surah Fatiha for Marhum Mushtaq Ahmad Sheikh.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on his soul and grant him the company of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad for Marhum Mushtaq Ahmad Shaykh. For your all Marhumin, please recite Surah Fatiha. <laughs>